I'm fine, Miss. Miss, are we having a test today? Uh, I will tell you to what signed. Sure. Okay, now let's start the lecture for today. Today we are going to start with chapter number uh, 15, that is about sources of finance. We are skipping the part from it. Actually, uh, that is, you know, those, those three chapters in between uh, are related to the related to the interest and foreign exchange. So we are going to have a look at the most important part, part first, and then we are going to look at those three chapters as well. So today we are going to start with the sources of finance. This chapter is related to the cost of capital. And Angelica, in this chapter, again, we do have a lot of theory. Like in the case of working capital, we had discussed that a lot of theory can be asked to do the examination for same case applies to this chapter. This All of this chapter is theory. So we are going to discuss the theory part for this. And this one is related to the cost of capital. And one question, one full-fledged question in section number C can be uh, expected from this part. Okay, that is from cost of capital. So sources of finance, as we do know that the organizations are dependent upon finance in order to run the operations, different kinds of finances are needed in the organization. Whenever the organizations have to purchase the assets, whenever they have to make the investments, whenever they have to invest in the working capital, the finance is needed. So whatever the operations organizations do have to carry on, the finance is of utmost importance. So in this chapter, we are going to learn about the different sources of finance, specifically divided among two broad parts, short-term sources and long-term sources. Under short-term sources of finance, we are going to have a look at the different short-term sources of finance, including overdraft, including short-term loans, including sale and lease back, and leasing is also going to be included in short-term sources of finance. Under long-term finance sources, we are going to look between uh, the different sources of finance, we are going to distinguish under long-term sources, especially equity and debt. Under long-term sources of finance, we do have two broad categories, equity and debt. So we are going to distinguish among them. As you can see, equity and debt. Under equity, we do have uh, two portions, raising equity and right issues. And under debt, we do need to consider about different forms of debts, including hybrids, convertibles, et cetera. And under long-term sources of finance, we are going to learn about leasing as well. So leasing does come under short-term sources as well as long-term. And we are going to consider about venture capital as well. Students, leasing, uh, short-term leasing, long-term leasing, venture capital, these are all theory portions. We do not have numericals related to them. So in the exam, they can ask you about the discussion regarding these sources of finance. Then we are going to discuss about the finance for small and medium enterprise. This is just a very small portion, okay? Just a paragraph you can see. And we are in last going to learn about the Islamic financing as well. So Islamic financing, small and medium term uh, enterprises, finance, leasing, venture capital, uh, hybrids. These are all theory related parts, okay? Regarding raising equity, right issues, and debt, we are going to have the numerical portions as well. Now, my dear students, we are going to learn first, we are going to see about the criteria for choosing between different sources of finance. Organizations do have different sources of finance in front of them. They have a choice to finance the organization by using different sources. So which criteria do they actually use in order to select in between the finances. The first criteria or factor under consideration would be the cost of a finance. And they do say that debts are usually cheaper than equity. When the organizations do have two broader kinds of finances in front of them, either to finance the operations by using debt or to finance the operations using equity, as per cost, they find debt as usually cheaper than the equity. Why is it so? Because behind debts, there is lesser risk involved. And behind equity, there is higher risk involved. So it is a very normal thing in financial management. It's a very basic thing, basic concept to be considered in FM that 
the debts are usually uh, cheaper than equity and this is because of the risk and return approach because higher the risk is the higher would be the return and lesser the risk is the less would be the return that is why the cost of debt for the organization is usually lesser than the cost of equity for the companies then the duration of the loan is also considered when choosing among the different sources of finance as we do know that long term finance is more expensive but secure if the organizations are taking long term finance it is more expensive because when the time period for the loan increases the risk attached to it also increases its repayment becomes more risky but long term finance on the one hand it's more expensive but it is secure on the other hand the firms usually match duration to assets purchased so as again as a normal thumb rule for financial management we do say that long term assets should be financed using long term finance where as short term assets should be financed using short term finance then the term structure of the interest rate needs to be considered as well in which relationship between interest and loan duration is considered usually short term is cheaper but not always we can say that because in short term loans the interest risk which is being taken is lesser that is why they are cheaper but it is not always the case we will say for example in the long term we are expecting that interest rates are going to be dropped that is why when there is a long term uh, duration of a, of a loan as well over there we can also find it cheaper so this is not always going to work even sometimes the short the short term uh loan becomes expensive and long term loan becomes cheaper then gearing what is the gearing it is the level of debt being used in the organization so after the now so the higher the level of debt being used in the organization the higher is going to be its gearing so when the gearing in the organization does increase it becomes more risky the operations of the organization do become more riskier we do accept the fact that the debt is cheaper source of finance because lesser risk is behind the debt uh, finance but when the gearing in the organization increases then obviously the risk in the organization becomes more why because mandatory repayments are involved in the case of debt financing it's most that even if the organization is not earning profit the principal amount and the interest have to be paid at the specific times so gearing usually using mainly debt is cheaper but high gearing is risky so for the organization debt financing can be cheaper but it is more risky as compared to the equity financing then accessibility all the sources of finance are not available for all the kinds of the organization say for example we have quoted companies we have unquoted companies we have uh those companies which are listed in the stock exchange we do have public companies we have private companies so different types of organization do have different criteria over to the accessibility to the finance so we are going to consider that whether the organization is having an accessibility to the particular source of finance or not in order to uh discuss about the criteria for choosing the appropriate source of finance so they say that buff provides a useful checklist of headings for an examination question that asks you to consider different types of finance after before you were not in the class i told students that we have started chapter number 15 of our book that is sources of finance and it is one of the longest chapter in our book and it is completely clear like i have told you in the working capital as well in that portion also we have a lot of theory and again in this portion we are starting with cost of capital in this portion in this chapter this is a starting chapter for cost of capital so we do have elaborated theory so i have prepared these slides but again i will recommend you to go through the book portion as well because over here i will be discussing more and the written thing is lesser So in order to revise the concepts please go through that chapter as well in your exam as you might have seen for taxation paper as well you will be required to discuss more okay so in this chapter i will try to discuss more and more things with you but do revise chapter number 15 from your books as well so this is the second most important portion of the book 
after investment appraisal, the second importance do give, we do give to this portion, okay? So this is chapter number 15. We have skipped 11, 12, and 13, uh, 14 right now, because that is the fourth portion, okay? So we are going to start it the last. We are on the third portion, second most important portion of our book. Okay, so the sources of finance, my dear students, now, again, I have repeated the thing that wherever there is a higher risk, higher returns can be expected. And whenever there is a higher return, the cost of capital for the company is higher. Please try to focus on this point that if the persons who are investing in the company are taking higher risk, they will be requiring higher return. And if they are requiring higher return, the cost of capital for the company is going to become higher. Say for example, Harshil is taking loan notes from my company and Atif is equity invested in my company. The dividend or the uh, return which I would be required to give Atif would be higher than the return interest which I will be giving to the Harshil. Why? Because Atif is taking more risk by investing in the company through equity shares as compared to the Harshil by which, which he is taking by taking the non notes from the company because Behind debts, there are mandatory repayments involved. Whether the company is earning profit or not, the interest payments and the principal amount has to be paid in a specified time. This does not apply to the case of the equity investors because dividend is purely upon the wish of the directors. Even if the company is earning profit, it is not mandatory that the company will be paying the dividends to the equity shareholders. On the other hand, whatever amount is left in the company after obligate, after paying off all the liabilities due uh, is given to the equity shareholders. It is not given to the debt providers. That is why equity investors do always take higher risks and they do require higher return from the company. And whoever is requiring higher return for the company, the cost of capital for the company would become higher. So higher the return is, the cost of capital for the company will become higher. And this portion is regarding the cost of capital for that company. So they say each time an investor demands a higher return on the finance, they have provided this is reflected in the higher cost of that finance to the company. This is fundamental principle in the financial management syllabus. So this thing, higher risk is equal to higher return and higher return is equal to higher cost of capital does form the basis of the financial management syllabus and particularly to this portion. Now, as we have discussed that this chapter is dependent upon two broad categories, short-term sources of finance and long-term sources of finance, they have told us, they have given us the list of different short-term sources of finance. You are already clear about all these short-term sources of finance again and again up to your life, up till now you have discussed these uh, points again and again. So they have just provided us a list, the short term sources of finance can be bank overdrafts, which are going to be demanded as per the wish of the bank. Uh, then we do have short term bank loans as well, behind which the interest and the principal has to be repaid at the specified times. Then we have discussed in the working capital chapter that by managing the working capital in a better way, we can earn short term finance. So if we are, say, for example, not paying the payables in time, we are delaying their payment. That amount which is going to be delayed is going to be providing us the short term source of finance. On the other hand, if we are, uh, we, if we are taking the amount from the receivables by tightening our credit policy, then that amount is also going to work as the working capital for us. Then squeezing trade credit. If we are squeezing up our trade credit, even then this is going to provide us the short-term source of finance. And then leasing. When we are leasing, leasing is basically kind of a rent. You know, if we are taking the thing, taking the property on rent, this also provides us the short-term source of finance. Lease can be short term and lease can be longer term as well. So short term lease is basically for the period which is lesser than 50 years. So if it is lesser than 50 years, it will be providing us the short term source of finance. If it is longer than uh, 50 years, it will be providing us the long term source of finance. Then sale and lease back. 
Sell and lease back is again a category of the short term finance. What is going to happen in the case of sale and lease back? We are going to sell something, we are going to sell an asset, and we are going to get the amount in lump sum. Then we are going to rent that same asset and we are going to use it in our organization. So on one hand, we are taking the lump sum amount. And again, when we are renting it out, we are paying the amount back in installments. So these different kinds of short-term sources of finance are going to be used in the organization. So they say about the short-term lease that what are the normal conditions involved in the short-term lease? My dear students, in lease, same like rent, because it works on the basis of rent. So what is going to happen that maintenance and overall uh, you know, liability of maintenance lies on the owner of the property. The person who is going to use the property or the asset will be giving the specified rental payments to the owner. So if it is short term uh, lease, then obviously it is going to last for less than 50 years. So what they say, the lease period, the lease period is less than the useful life of the asset. The lesser, who is lesser? The person who is owning the property, who is owning the asset is the lesser. Lesser relies on subsequent leases or eventual sale of the asset to cover their capital outlay and show a profit. Lesser's business, the lesser may very well carry on a trade in this type of the asset, risks and rewards. The lesser is normally responsible for repairs and maintenance cancellation. The lease can sometimes be canceled at short notice. So however, this short term lease can also be in the form of uh, leasing. Uh, okay, now long term sources of finance. There are two basic long term sources of finance debt and equity. So, one by one, we are going to have a look at them. Under equity, we do have three kinds of share capital ordinary share capital, cumulative preference shares, and non cumulative preference shares. They do have their different characteristics in the organization. Students, the owners of the organizations are those who are having the ordinary share capital of the organization. The person who are having preference shares of any kind are normally not regarded as the owners of the company. For ordinary share capital, the dividend which has to be paid comes on the last priority in the organization. First, the payment has to be made to the debt providers. Then if money is being left, the amount has to be paid as dividend to the preference shareholders. Then if any amount is being left, it will be given to the ordinary shareholders. They are the persons who will require the higher, highest amount of the return because they are taking the highest risk in the organization. It is not mandatory that their dividend is going to be paid every year by the organization. Whatever is left in the organization after fulfilling all the obligations does go to the ordinary share capital providers. So they are the ones who are basically the owners of the company. They do have voting rights in the company as well. For preference shareholders, it is not always the case that they will be having the voting rights in the company. But for ordinary share capital providers, it is mandatory that they will be having the voting rights in the company. Then come to the cumulative preference shares. These are the providers of the finance in the company for which we, we are going to give them the priority over to the other shareholders. And their dividend, if not provided in one year, is going to be accumulated in the next years. So if say, for example, we are not giving them any voting rights, if their uh, dividend is not being paid for the three years consecutively, then they will be given the right in the voting. So they will be having the priority in the dividend after paying the amount to the debt providers. The second in line will be the cumulative preference shares. So normally they do not have the right in the voting, but if their dividend is being accumulated for consecutive three years, then they will be started to have right in the voting. Then non-cumulative preference shares, they again will be having the priority over to the ordinary share capital providers, but their dividend if not paid in one particular year is not going to be accumulated. And again, for preference shareholders, there will be the fixed amount of dividend for both of them, for cumulative and non-cumulative, it works normally like the uh, debt. Okay, so, but in the case of the ordinary share capital, the amount of dividend is not fixed. For these, both of these, the dividend amount is fixed. Clear, Dr. here? But in this case, non-cumulative. Sorry? In case of non-cumulative, uh, they have been not paid and they will not be carrying out the 
No, no, right. non cumulative, yes. So the, the, uh, the value of dividends will be lost in the, uh, if they are not being paid or they will be paid in the next year? No, it, it will be lost. It will again be on the wish of the directors if they do want to give the one off dividend payment to them as a surplus amount, as the residual amount that they can give. But if it is not being paid in one year, then it is going to be lost. Their dividend is not going to accumulate. Okay, so they will be having the priority over to the ordinary share capital if dividend has to be given to the ordinary share capital providers first, it has to be given to the non cumulative preference share holders. If they are not being given, then even to the ordinary share capital holders, it is not going to be provided. Cleared? Okay, now students, in long term sources of finance, in order to raise equity, we do have three basic uh, ways. First is retained earnings. The second is drive issue. And the third one is new external share issue. The first category retained earning is uh, the way in which the organization is using its retained earning in order to operate the operations. Say, for example, the organization is not issuing any kind of shares, but the amount which is retained in the organization and is not given as the dividends to the any shareholders, it will be used as the finance in the organization. So the cost which organization is going to be or in order to use retained earnings in the organization will be zero. So this will be bringing zero cost to the organization. But the major drawback of using retained earnings as the uh, source of finance for the organization is that the shareholders are not going to become happy. They will obviously be they will obviously be requiring some amount of dividends. They do not want all the retained earnings to be invested in the organization, but they do want some of the dividends to be given to them. So retained earnings is used by the organization in order to carry on its operations as a way of source of finance. It will be bringing zero cost of capital for the company. Then right issues. In the case of right issues, as we do know, that the shares are going to be issued to the existing shareholders. It will not be issued to the new external shareholders, but the right issues are going to be issued at the price which is lesser than the market price to the existing shareholders of the company. And the ratio of their right shares will be as per their existing shares, which are they holding in the company. Then the third case can be the new external share issues. In this case, instead of issuing the shares to the existing shareholders, the shares are going to be issued by placings or by any other method to the external shareholders, external investors to the company. Now, my dear students, we are going to have a look at the right issues in little bit detail. So what are right issues? It is a kind of a right, it is a kind of an issue in which the shares are issued to the existing shareholders at a price lesser than the market value in the predetermined ratio, in the ratio which is already being held by the shareholders. So a right issue is an offer to existing shareholders to subscribe for new shares at a discount to the current market value in proportion to their existing holdings. So my dear students, in the case of right issue, the cost of issuing for the company will be lesser because to the existing shareholders, the company is issuing the shares, there is no need for proper advertisement. The admin cost is going to be lesser. The basic attraction for the shareholders to get the right issue will be that they will be getting these right issues at a price which is much lesser than the market value. If they are going to purchase the shares from the market, obviously it will be at the higher price. But if they are purchasing the shares from the company, then they are being issued at the discounted price than the market price of the company. So by, by issuing right shares, the cost is going to be lesser as compared to the ordinary share capital which is being issued to the general public. But the cost is going to be higher as compared to the debt financing. Now, the right of preemption enables them to retain their existing share of voting right and can be waived with the agreement of the shareholders. Now, when the right issues are going to be made, then it depends upon the wish of the shareholders whether they do want to take up the rights, whether they do want to sell the rights, whether they do want to ignore the thing, or whatever their wish is according to that, they can. So it is not mandatory for the shareholders to take the rights. It's not mandatory. If they want to take it up, then it's fine. If they do want to let it go, even then it's fine. So we are required to calculate the PERP, which is theoretical X right price. 
what is theoretical x right price students it is the price of the shares after right issue being made obviously when the right issue is going to be made it will be at a price which is lesser than the market price of the shares so when the shares are going to be issued at the price which is lesser than the market value after this issue the price of all the shares is going to become uh, the new one so that theoretical x right price is the price which is after the uh, issue of the right shares so they say the new share price after the issue is known as theoretical x right price and is calculated by finding the weighted average of the old price and the right price weighted by the number of shares so the formula simple formula which they have given us to calculate terp is market value of the shares already in issue plus proceeds from the new share issue divided by number of shares in issue after the right issue so this will be basically the denominator is the total number of shares after making the right issue and in the numerator you are going to take the market value of the shares which has been already taken plus the proceeds which you are going to take by making a new share issue anjlika have you understood yes miss okay let's move on students here is understanding number 1 in which we are required to calculate terp that is theoretical x right price so they say that a company which has issued capital of 2 million shares so my dear students the existing shares are how much 2 million shares having the current market value of 2.7 the current market value of these shares is 2.7 makes a right issue of one new share for every two students what is the proportion of the right issue one for every two existing shares at a price of 2.1 now you can analyze that the right issue is being made at a price which is lesser than the market value so you can revise the concept here as well that right issue is a kind of an issue in which the shares are going to be issued at a discounted price than the market value so students we are required to calculate terp in which we are going to take the market value of the existing shares in issue existing existing shares in issue are 2 million and their market value is 2.7 plus the proceeds from the new right issue how many proceeds we are taking from the new right issue how many new shares are being issued students 2 million shares were already there and one for every two so it will be how many shares new right issue will be 1 million so 1 million multiplied by the right price is 2.10 divided by total shares in issue 1 million are new right issue and 2 million are existing So how many total shares are going to be there now? Three million. So this is going to be the theoretical x right price. Is everyone clear? Yes. The price is same. Same? There is no change in the price. How much it is? Two no. percent. No. It it will be around. It will be in between both two point five or something. Two point five. Two point five directly. Two point five. Yes, it it should be in middle. So radical x prize is like this. Two point one. You are not getting the same. Yes, yes, yes. Two point five. Ah, that's that's fine. Look, it's it's the formula is the market value of the existing shares plus the proceeds from the new right issue divided by the total number of shares. Now, okay, now students understanding number two. Again, you are required to calculate theoretical x right price. ABC announces a two four five right issue at two per share. So now the proportion of the shares being offered is two four five, and the right issue price is two dollars per share. There are currently ten million shares in issue. and the current market price of the shares is 2.7 so my dear students right issue is how much how many number of right issue shares are being made it's 2 for 5 existing shares at 10 million and the proportion is 2 for 5 so how much it will be 4 million shares 
4 million shares are new ones. And the existing are how much? 10 million. So total number of shares in issue will be now 14 million. So we have to apply the formula. That is market value of the existing shares. Existing shares are 10 million and their market value is 2.7 plus proceeds from the new issue. Uh, the new issue is how much? 4 million. The proceeds from this, this issue is 2 million. Uh, sorry, $2 per share divided by total number of shares that is 14 million. So this will be the theoretical X right price. Clear, Hashim? Two point five again. Okay. Atif, did you get the same? Two point five. Okay. May I erase it? Students, in this case, if say for example the new price is now theoretical X right price is two point five, and in this case, if you see the price, the market price after uh, you know the the right issue price is two. And the market value before is 2.7. So what will be the value of right? What? What will be the value of right? There is a value of right. X -right Theoretical X right price, how much? 2.5. And the market value has been 2.7. So what is the value of right? 0.2. Yeah. Got it? So that is this is what we are going to discuss in the next. Example. Okay, now here they are explaining about the value of the right. As you can see, this diagram in this illustration, try to understand this that the right issues are being made at the price which is lesser than the market price. So the theoretical X price which you do get after a right issue is basically lesser than the market price and little bit higher than the issue price. That is what we have this described in the previous. Uh, understanding as well as I was telling you that it should be in middle, it should be in middle of the previous market value and the new price. So this theoretical X right price is in middle, uh, lesser than the market value but higher than the issue price. So the value of right is basically what? It is X right price value afterwards, that is theoretical X right price. So if you are required to calculate the value of right, it is theoretical X right price what is theoretical X right price? This is theoretical X right price minus issue price. So from this total price, if you are going to deduct the issue price, this is the value of right. For uh, you know the value the, the for the right issue, the price which you are paying is the value of right. So if you want to sell the right shares at this price, this is going to be the benefit for the person who are selling. This value of the right will be the benefit because they are getting the shares at this price, but they, they can sell the shares in the market at this price. So the extra price which they are getting is their benefit. So the benefit is value of the right, which they are getting. Okay, so value of the right is theoretical X right price minus issue price. So value of right for existing share will be that is value of right, theoretical X right price minus issue price will be value of right divided by number of shares needed to obtain a right. Since rights have a value, they can be sold on the stock market in the period between the right issue being announced and the right to existing shareholders being issued. And the new share actually, new issue actually taking place. So we can sell the right shares in the market as well. Now here my students in understanding three and four, you are required to calculate the value of the right. In part A, they say, what is the value of the right in Babel company? And in part B, what is the value of the right in Babel company for existing share? So two formulas we have discussed over here. What is value of right? That is CERP minus issue price. And value of right for existing share, you have to divide value of right divided by Number of shares needed to obtain a right. Please consider this is not the total number of shares. This is number of shares needed to obtain a right. How many of the existing shares you are requiring in order to get the right shares? You have to divide value of right by this in order to get value of the right for existing share. Now in Babel company and in ABC company, in both the cases, 
please calculate the value of the shear and value of the shear for existing uh, existing shears. So what was the TRP? TRP in both the cases, it was 2.5. So what is the formula for value of the right? It is TRP minus issue price. So in the first case, it will be 2.5 minus what is the issue price? Issue price has been 2.1. So the value of the right will be how much? 0.4. Same is going to be for this case. TERP is 2.5. Current issue price is has been 2 per share. So it will be how much? 0.5. Value of the right. Now you have to calculate the value of the right for existing for, for existing shares. How much it is going to be? In the first case, how many shares have been required? How many existing shares have been required? 1, 4, 2. So this will be the value of the right for existing share. In this case, how many shares have been required? 2, 4, 5. So this will be the value of the share, value of the right for existing share. Point two. point two. For the first case, it's point two. Both. 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 So this is how you are going to calculate the value of the right in the exam in the multiple choice question. Sometimes it do come. Okay, TERP or the value of right, and in more complex questions, they are going to add it also. Now, my dear students, for right issue, as I told you, that there are different options which are available to the shareholders. What is the first option? Take up their rights by buying the specified proportion at the price offered. If they want not to take all of the shares which are being offered to them, they can take the proportion of the right shares. Then renounce their rights and sell them in the market. So they can take up the rights and they can then sell them into the market. Then renounce part of their rights and take up the remainder. They do, if they do want, they can sell some of their rights and take up the remainder. And the fourth option is do nothing. In the last case, your shareholder wealth is not going to be changed. Now, understanding number five is there. We are asking that using the information in just your understanding one, a shareholder B had 1,000 shares in Babel company before the right offer. So before the right offer, if suppose if a person B is having 1,000 shares in Babel company, Calculate the effect on net worth of B of each of the following options. So if he has existing 1000 shares and you are using the information in the Babel company, what would be the effect on his net wealth if he is taking any of these options? The first one is take up shares. The second option is sell the rights. The third option is do nothing. For you health students, they have given us few amounts as well. Come right price. What is come right price? It is the price before to the right issue. X right price, that is TRP. Price you, after the. Can you say come right price is the market price? Sorry? Come right price is the market price? Yes, you can say. You can say. So come right price is the price before to the right issue. The X right price, that is the price of the share after the right issue being made. Then issue price, this is the price at which the right issues are being made and the value of the right, it is the net benefit which the person is getting by getting the right shares. Now, come right price, they are telling also market value of the shares before the right issue. Buyers of the share quoted come right are entitled to forthcoming rights. Now students, we have to apply this on first illustration, that is Babel company. If say for example, B is having existing shares of 1000 and if he is taking up the right shares as well, what will be the effect on his wealth? So Babel company which has issued capital of 2 million shares having the current market value of 2.7. 
Now, before to the right issue, the market value has been 2.7. Now, after taking up the rights, after right issues being made, even if somebody is taking up the rights or not, the price of the share is going to be changed. It will become theoretical X right price. Am I right? So for 1,000 existing shares, what will be the price? To, what was theoretical X right price? 2.5. So 2,500. And if he's taking up the shares, the option was 140. So 1,000 multiplied by 500 new right issue has been taken. So for 500, what will be the price? 2.5. How much it is? Sorry? 1250. Sure? Sure. No way. Yeah, just like it. 1250. Okay, so this will be his total wealth now. How much it is? 3750. If he is taking up the shares. Now, students, if he is selling the rights, what would be the effect? Can anyone tell me? Can you please make your workings if he is selling up the rights? There will not be any effect on this case. This will be remaining with him. But if he is selling the rights, what would be the effect? Sorry? Point 0.4 would be the net benefit. That is the value of the right. So 1000 multiplied by 2.5, it will be 2500. Am I right, students? Is it 2500? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then, then if he is, he is purchasing the shares at how much price? If you are not taking the value of right, if you are doing the detailed work. If he is purchasing the 500 shares have been purchased at which price? 2.1. At 2.1, they have been purchased. So what is the price which he is paying? 500 into 2.1? 1050. One, and now he is selling the rights. At which price he is going to sell the rights? 2.5. So that is basically the value of right. Value of right has been 0 0.4. So how much price he is going to take? Uh, 1250. So this will be the net effect on his wealth. Sorry? Yes, but I, I am trying to elaborate the concept, okay? So he is purchasing at 2.1, but he is now selling at the price which is high. At theoretical extra price, he is going to uh, sell, sell it. So what is going to be the total effect on the wealth students? Sorry? 2,700. Okay, now if he is doing nothing, then what is going to happen then? 2,500. 1,000 only at 2.5. That is 2,500. So this is going to be the effect students. Got it? Eshika, are you clear, dear? Yes, miss. <laughs> Okay, now students, long-term sources of finance, raising equity, new external share issue. Instead of uh, using the retained earning as the source of finance, or instead of making the right issue, the companies can make the new external share issue as well. But you need to keep in mind that new external share issue is the type of the source which is not available to all of the companies, especially in the case of unquoted companies. Unquoted companies are basically unlisted companies. Those companies which once have been listed on the stock exchange and had issued their shares to the general public but now are not allowed. They have become unquoted and they are not allowed to issue their shares to the general public. Maybe because their number of shares have been lesser or whatever the thing has been because they may not be following the rules and regulations of the stock exchange. Whatever the case is, they are not allowed to trade their shares at the stock exchange. So for unquoted companies, it is very difficult to share, issue the shares to the new shareholders, to the uh, existing shareholders, they can. They can do the placings, they can do the uh, enter, uh, in, you know, the enterprise investment schemes they can make, but they are not allowed to issue the shares to the general public. 
So unquoted companies, what is the company requirement? Finance without an immediate stock market quotation because they are not allowed to issue the shares to the general public. But what they can do, if they do want to issue the shares to the general public, then they do have to take the help of the placings or EIS. Now, what is a placing? Do anyone know about this? Maybe you have uh, learned this term in F5 or F7. What is placing? Forgot it? Yes. Placing is basically that instead of issuing the shares to the general public, you know, uh, by, by themselves, the organizations are going to place their shares with some particular financial institution, say, for example, banks. Banks. Like may you, may, maybe you have heard the term of underwriting. It is very much similar to the underwriting. Yes, in this case, the commission is not going to be there, but in this case, the extra amount they are going to take as a benefit in the case of placing. So they are going to, in case of placing, they are going to purchase all the shares from the company itself and for purchasing those shares, obviously, they do require their own benefit, their own return as well. So this is normally the placing uh, is being done by the financial institutions, specifically banks. So as the unquoted companies cannot issue the shares to the general public directly, that is why they do take the help of placings or they can take the help of the enterprise investment scheme, that is EIS. It is again similar to the placings. And in this case, again, the enterprises are going to take some amount of benefit from the company in order to issue the shares to the general public. So the types of the investors who are going to help the unquoted company in this process are individual merchant banks, finance corporations. Now, in the case of unquoted or quoted companies, both of them, if unquoted companies there or the quoted companies there, their requirement can be finance with an immediate quotation, finance with the new issue. So in the case of unquoted company, they cannot directly issue the shares to the general public, but the quoted company can issue the shares to the general public. We can finance with the new issue. Now, what is the method of issue? Stock exchange or small firm market placing. So in the case of unquoted company, they can take the help of the small firm market placing or in the case of quoted company, they can take the stock exchange as the medium of issuing the shares to the general public. Now, when the organizations do want investing in the stock exchange, they can take the help of small firm market placing as well. Suppose they need to place their shares at the enter enterprise investment scheme, or they can place the shares in the small firms. And after that, further to that, they can issue the shares to the general public. So step by step, they have to move on. Then they, the method of issue can be public offer. If the organization is already quoted, then they have the uh, liberty to issue the shares to the general public. Public offer, this can be fixed price or offer for sale by tender. In case of fixed price, the persons do not, the investors do not have the liberty to fix the price by bidding. If it is by tender, then obviously we can bid and the strike price, which is going to be decided, will be among investors and the company. So the type of investors which will be interested in these options will be the investing public, like any kind of general community persons, pension funds, insurance companies, and other financial institutions. Now, type of the company quoted or unquoted, the company requirements can be limited finance without offering shares to the non-shareholders. So offering shares to the non-shareholders, it is the general type of equity share capital, which is going to be issued not to the existing shareholders. So the method of the issue is right issue. And the type of the investor would be the holder of the existing shares. Now, choosing between sources of equity. Which source of equity you must be adopting? It depends upon the circumstances of the company and circumstances of the market. They say when choosing between sources of equity finance, either to do the issue to the general public, either to go for the right issue or to use the retained earnings, upon which factors it is going to be dependent, the accessibility of the finance, like we have discussed for the cases of quoted, unquoted companies. The amount of finance, how much amount of finance is required. If the amount of finance which is being required is lesser, then or only by using the retained earnings, we can 
go for that. If the amount of finance is a little bit higher, then right issue is going to be recommendable. Or the third option is new external share issue. Cost of the issue procedure. In the case of retained earning, the least cost is involved, higher than debt financing, but lesser than the right issue and new external share issues. In the case of right issue, the cost is higher. And in the case of external share issue, it is most highest. The pricing of the issue. Obviously, the pricing of the issue, the price which has to be set for the issue is again, again going to be discussed in detail. Why? Because if the price being set, issue price being set for the shares is very high, then the organization company would not be able to sell all of its shares. And even after bearing the cost, organization would be in loss. Then control. There can be a dilution of control when the organization is issuing the shares to the new shareholders, especially in that case, their control is going to be diluted. The control of the organization is being given to the new hands. In the case of right issue, it is lesser. In the case of retained earnings, it's not there. Then dividend policy. Using retained earnings could impact the share price. Obviously, the dividend holders, the persons who do want the dividend from the company equity investors do not want all of the retained earnings to be used for investment purposes. They do want the dividend to be given to them. So if the retained earnings are going to be used, they are going to impact the share price. So in the next chapter of the dividend policy, we are going to have a look at this concept as well. Because of the relevant issue costs and the ease of organization, the most important source of equity is retained earning, then right issues, then new issues. So as for the cost, the least cost will be in the case of retained earning, then right issues, and then new issues. Now, my dear students, the second important category of the long-term finance is debt. And whenever we do take the name of debt, the first name which comes to us is bond or loan note. Bonds and loan notes are the similar terms which are being given to the long-term source of finance debt for the company. In ordinary language, in general language, we do call them as debentures also. So they say a bond is written acknowledgement of a debt by a company. That written acknowledgement is basically a contract. Say a piece of paper will be given to you when you do purchase a debenture or bond from the company or the loan note. And that piece of paper will be forming an uh, acknowledgement of the amount which you have given to the company. Students, each bond does have a face value of 100. Okay, that is the basic face value which is being given to that loan note. So a bond is a written acknowledgement of a debt by a company normally containing provisions as to the payment of interest and the terms of the repayment of principal. Whenever the bond is being issued, it is like 10% loan note, 2000 24. It means that the amount of interest involved with that loan note is 10% and the date of its redemption is 2024. The amount is going to be redeemed at the year 2024. So this is the normal heading which you do find on the top of the debenture or the loan note. So they say bonds are also known as debentures, loan notes or loan stock. They are traded on stock market in much the same way as shares. So as you do buy or sell the shares at the stock exchange in the same way, loan notes are also traded in the stock exchange, are usually denominated in blocks of $100 nominal value. Students, every time the interest is going to be calculated on the nominal value. So if you have to calculate the interest on the loan note, you have to use the nominal value, do not use the market value. Maybe secured or unsecured. Secure debt will carry a charge over one or more specific assets, usually land and building, which are more based in a fixed charge. All assets, that is a floating charge. So my dear students, the secured debt can be secured against any of the fixed assets, and that fixed asset cannot be sold unless the person who is having the security over that is not allowing us to do that. On the other case, it can be in all assets, especially on the current asset. This is security is being given and the charge is going to be floating then. One after another, the current assets are going to be sold and the charge will become the floating one. On default, the loan note holders can appoint a receiver to administer the assets until the interest is paid. So the company which is giving the person who is giving the loan, if, if it's a very high amount, they can 
have an administrator or the receiver in the company who is exactly going to look at the assets of the company and will be looking at whether their amount is secured in the company or not. Alternatively, the assets may be sold to repay the principal. Maybe redeemable or irredeemable. Sometimes the loan which is being provided by the company is redeemable. It is going to be returned by the company after the specified date that is known as redeemable debt. Sometimes they are irredeemable. The principal is not going to be paid ever. This is irredeemable, but interest is going to be paid in perpetuity. What is the meaning of perpetuity? Up to the indefinite lifetime period, the interest is going to be paid, but the principal amount is never going to be repaid. So the, the law notes can be redeemable or irredeemable. Irredeemable debt is not repayable after any specified time in the future. Instead, interest is payable in perpetually. As said, well as some bonds, preference shares are often redeemable. It should be noted that as the form of finance, irredeemable debts in very, in, uh, is very rare in reality. So you are not going to find the irredeemable debts very, uh, you know, very common. They are rare. If the debt is redeemable, the principal will be repayable at the future date. So I hope that you are clear about the discussion. So students, you can see that there are some jargons being used. You need to be cleared about them, okay? And when you are going to write in the exam, please make sure that you are using those jargons. Even, even if those jargons are uh, less related to the things which you are discussing, try to tell examiner that you have the knowledge. Try to put the discussion by using those jargons. Okay. Okay. Then illustration number one. They are just telling that how the law notes, uh, you know, are going to come. If the company has five percent 2020 law notes redeemable at par, what is the meaning of par? The nominal value. They are going to be redeemed. They are going to be re uh, returned at the face value. Quoted at 95 x interest. X interest means that after deducting the amount of interest, the remaining amount is 95. This description refers to the loan note that pay interest at 5% on the nominal value, that is $5 per 100. This is known as the coupon rate. Students, what is coupon rate? That is, what is coupon rate? Interest rate. Sorry? Coupon rate means inclusion of tax or sorry, the interest? No. With the interest? Yes. Yes, that is that is the nominal value. That is going to be the nominal value. And that is come, come interest with the value of the interest. Without the value of the interest, it's X interest. Okay. Okay, are redeemable in year 2020 will be repaid at par value. That is each hundred dollar nominal value will be repaid at hundred. Currently have a market value of 95 per hundred dollars without right to the current year interest payments because these are X interest. So do not have the right to the current year interest. Okay, now students, different types of the bonds. Yes, team. Right? It's just for 10. At 4.30, you can have. At the time of prayer. Yes. Okay. Now, different types of the bond students, the two basic, sorry? Yes, sure, sure, sure. If you want to switch it off, you can. If you want to switch it off on the left, yes. Just press it once, it is going to be switched. It takes time to switch off. Switched on. Now it's Now it's Okay, now students, different types of the bonds deep discount bond and zero coupon bond. As its name is suggesting, deep discount bond, uh, bond it is going to be issued at a price which is very lesser than the market price. And it is going to be redeemed at par. Got it? It is going to be redeemed at the par value, but it is going to be issued at the price which is very lesser than the market price. So deep discount bond is like that. 
So these are the loans, loan notes issued at a price that is a large discount to the nominal value of the loan note notes, and which will be redeemable at par or above par when they eventually mature. The low initial price by the investor is balanced against the lower rate of return offered on the bond. Much of the return gained by the investor comes from the capital gain when bond is redeemed. So when the bond is redeemed, obviously the redemption value is higher than the price at which the loan notes have been issued. So the investor, the person can sell those loan notes in the market and the capital gain is going to form the benefit for that investor. In the case of zero coupon bond students, they say these are the bonds that are issued at the discount to their redemption value but no interest is paid on them. So now at the redemption, the amount which is going to be paid for them at uh, that time, the price at the time of the issue, the price which is being taken is much lesser than that redemption value, but no interest is going to be paid on zero coupon bonds. Okay, so coupon rate uh, is basically an interest rate and zero coupon bonds, no interest is going to be there. Now. Uh, another type of the loan note is hybrid or convertible. Students, hybrid means having the quality of two different items. So hybrids are going to have the quality of the debt and equity financing both. So these can be in the form of convertibles. Say, for example, the loan notes are being issued, but they are with the capacity that in the future they can be converted to the shares at the predetermined price or at the predetermined ratio. So these are going to be the convertibles. So they say some types of finance have element of both debt and equity, that is convertible loan notes. So what are convertible loan notes? Convertibles give the holder the right to convert to other securities, normally ordinary shares at either a predetermined price or a predetermined ratio. So at a predetermined price, that is notes may be converted into shares at a value of 400 cents per share or a predetermined ratio, 100 loan stock, 100 of the stock may be converted into 25 ordinary shares. Now, my dear students, when the convertibles are going to be issued, a conversion premium can also occur. What is a conversion premium? At the time of conversion, the benefit which is being taken is known as a conversion premium, which is going to happen if the value of the market value of the convertible stock, the stock which has to be converted. If its market value is more than the market price of the shares, the stock is to be converted into. So they have given an example. If stock trading at 102 to be converted into 10 shares currently trading at nine, each has the conversion premium of 102 minus 10 into nine, that is $12 per share is going to be the conversion premium. And what is the floor value? Floor value is again a jargon. That is the value of the convertible loan note is the minimum market price. What is the floor value? It is a minimum market price of the note. Now, since it attaches no value to the conversion, when obviously the loan note has to be converted into the shares. Right now, you do not know at the time of the conversion what value it is going to have. So it is attaching no value at the time of the conversion, but you want to know that how much value it is going to have. That is why you are going to, uh, in, in this way, you are going to make any kind of decision. So in that case, they say it is the present value. It is the present value of the future interest payments plus the present value of the cash redemption value. So what is going to be the floor value then? It will be the present value of the future interest payments plus the present value of the cash redemption value. You are going to convert them into the present value in order to get the floor value. And what is the floor value? It is the minimum market price of the loan note at the time of the conversion. So what is that? The floor value of the convertible loan note is the minimum market price of the note. And they say that is the value of a straight debenture would have with no conversion rights. So this is again a jargon, okay? Which is the floor value? It is the minimum market price of the note, which it which is having the capacity to be converted. Now, students, hybrids, that is loan notes with warrants. Now, again, in the case of the loan notes issued with warrants are going to have more security. They again will be having the capacity of being converted. 
So they say warrants give the holder the right to subscribe at a fixed future date for the certain number of ordinary shares at a predetermined price. Now, in the case of warrants, we are going to have the capacity to convert the loan notes, convert the securities, not specifically loan notes. Loan notes may not be converted, but the other securities to be converted to the shares at a fixed predetermined date and a predetermined price. So they are going to offer much more high security as compared to the convertibles. But if these loan notes, uh, if the warrants are attached to the loan notes, there will be some differences. They say if warrants are issued with loan notes, the loan notes are not converted into equity. Instead, bondholders make a cash payment for the shares, retain the loan notes until redemption, often used as sweeteners on debt issues. Interest rate on the loan is low and loan may be unsecured. Right to buy equity set at an attractive price and bondholders can sell the warrants after buying the loan notes thereby decreasing the cost of buying the loan notes. Now, there are no specific questions on the hybrids or the loan notes with warrants. This is again for the theory purpose. If they ask you to compare different sources of finance, it can come just for eight marks or something like that, in which you will be required to discuss all the sources of finance. Now, under long-term finance students, we do have long-term leasing as well, which is as contrary to the short-term leasing, we'll be having a period of lease of more than 50 years. So it will be for most of the part of the working useful life of the asset. For most of the useful life of the asset, it is going to be rented. Now, again, in the case of the uh, long-term lease, the risk and rewards do have to be with the lesser, but normally they are given to the lessee. Why? Because the most of the juice for life of the asset will be given to the lessee itself. So they say the lease period, one lease exists for the whole useful life of the asset, though maybe primary and secondary period. Lesser's business, the lesser does not usually deal directly into this type of the asset. In the case of short-term lease, it's an ordinary course of business for the lesser. He has a business of giving the lease of different assets. So in the case of long-term finance leasing, we do not consider it. Risk and rewards. The lesser does not retain the risk and rewards of the ownership. Lessee is responsible for repairs and maintenance. And cancellation, the lease agreement cannot be canceled. The lessee has the liability for all payments since it is long term. In the case of short term lease, the cancellation can happen. So in the case of long term lease, you can see that whole life of the asset is divided into primary and secondary time period. The primary period is rent is obligatory in that case, lesser covers the cost. And in the second time period, the termination is allowed. Rental amounts are normal. Asset may be sold with lessee receiving most of the proceeds. They say the length of the primary period will vary from asset to asset, depending on total expected economic life. The decision whether to lease or buy is both a practical and financial one. And the financial choice was discussed in the chapter on asset investment decisions. Do you remember? Investment appraisal, we had discussed that whether to, whether to finance an asset or to lease an asset. Okay, now venture capital. My dear students, with the help of venture capital, as capitalists, we can uh, gain a finance in the organization. Who are venture capitalists? These are the investors. This is the normal name which we do give to the investors. They do have a trading. They have do have the business of investing into different businesses. They do purchase different kinds of the business. They do act as the promoters for them. So a proper you know, business planning has to be shown to them. If they find it attractive, they will be ready to invest in that particular business. So as a source of finance, we can use venture capitalists as well. So what is venture capital? Venture capital is the provision of risk bearing capital, usually in the form of participation in equity to companies with high growth potential. So once the venture capitalists are agreed, then they will be only ready to finance the company. Otherwise, they will not. Venture capitalists provide startup and late stage growth finance, usually for smaller firms. 
venture capitalists will assess an investment prospect on the basis of financial outlook, management credibility, depth of market research, technical abilities, degree of influence offered, that is whether they will be allowed to control stake or they will be having the board seat or not, and the exit, exit route, often through eventual flotation of the business. Students, what is flotation? What is the meaning of flotation? The company becoming public uh, limited company from private limited company so that they can get a chance to uh, issue their shares to the general public. So on the basis of all these factors, venture capitalists are going to decide whether they should be investing in the company or not. If the financial outlook, management credibility, all these factors are positive for venture capitalists, they will be ready to invest in the company. Now, my students, the last discussion in this chapter is regarding Islamic sources of finance. Islamic sources of finance are of various kinds, and we are going to discuss only five out of them. The first one is Murabha, then Ijara, Sukuk, Mudarba, and Musharika. These five are the popular kinds of the Islamic financing. We generally do know that in Islamic financing, riba interest is not allowed. And instead of that, the profit and loss sharing term is being introduced. So in all these five cases, you are going to find that common thing. What is Murabaha? It works as the normal trade credit. But when we do talk about the Islamic financing, we do consider that the person who is providing the finance will actually be getting the possession and control of the asset. And then uh, it's going to take in the loan, in the kind of the loan, but the profit and loss sharing is going to be there. So it normally works in the normal kind of the trade credit. Then Ijra, in the case of Ijra, it's the normal lease finance. But in this case, what is going to happen? The lease is going to have the profit settlement in that. Again, we cannot say that interest payments are going to be involved. In the normal lease, we do say that the interest payment is going to be involved but not in the case of Ijra. Other than that, all the working is going to remain the same. The, in the same case as the lease is going to happen, short-term lease is going to happen, this Ijra is also going to happen. Then Sukuk, this is the kind of the financial instruments. Sukuk holders, like we do, make the dependent holders, there are Sukuk holders in the case of Islamic financing as well. They will not be getting the interest on the debt instruments, on the financial instruments, but they will be getting the profit and loss here. In the normal debt holders case, we do, uh, you know, we, we are on the fact that the amount which is being provided by them is given to the other persons from those persons we are taking the interest and the interest is then paid to those dependent holders. But in the case of Suku, the terms are going to be different. We are on the basic fact that the amount which we are taking from the Suku holders is invested in some business. And from that business, the profit is going to be earned and that profit will be given to those persons. Then we do have Mudarba. Mudarba is the kind of a partnership in the case of Islamic financing where one person will be giving the specialist skills and the other person will be investing by the money. So one person will be giving the skills and the other person is giving the amount of investment. The person who is giving the investment in the form of money will be liable for the losses. But the person who is giving the specialist skill will not be liable for any of the losses of the business. So this is how the mudarba is going to work. Then we do have musharika, that is again the kind of the venture capital, but all the persons who are involved in musharika will be making the investment. So this is the normal kind of the partnership. So in mudarba, we do have one person with skills and the other person with the investment. In the case of musharika, all the persons who are involved will be investing like an ordinary partnership. And the amount is going to be distributed among them in the case of pro profit and loss sharing ratio, like an ordinary thing. Now, students, we do have, uh, we have ended this chapter. The discussion is over. Now we do have practice questions. Let's discuss them and then you can have a break. And then we are going to start our next chapter that is for numerical questions. Now, which of the following is key feature of the debt as a source of finance? Interest must be paid irrespective of the levels of profit generated by the company. Is this a feature of debt? Is this a feature? Yes. So this is the feature of the debt. Interest must be paid. 
irrespective of the level of the profits generated by the company. So first one is the right answer. Let's see the other options as well. Debt holders are repaid last in the case of the winding up of the company. No, they are paid first. Debt holders hold full voting rights. No. Debt holders suffer relatively high levels of risk. No, they suffer less level of risk as compared to the equity providers. Then students, which two of the following statements are correct? Bank overdrafts are repayable on demand. Is it correct? Yes, this is correct. Warrants give the holder the right to subscribe at a fixed future date for a certain number of ordinary shares at a predetermined price. Yes, this is the definition of warrant. We have discussed. Preference dividends are paid before loan interest is paid. Is this? They are going to have the preference over to the ordinary share capital, not to the loan providers. This is wrong. The discount bonds are issued at a discount to their redemption value and no interest is paid on them. This is wrong. This is the definition of zero coupon bonds. Okay. So option one and two are the right ones. Clear, Hasha? Yes. Okay, now students understanding number nine, which of the following best describes the term coupon rate as applied on the loan notes? This is the rate of stamp duty applicable to the purchases of the loan notes. Is this the total rate of return on the loan notes taking into account capital repayment as well as the interest payments? The annual interest received div divided by the current X interest market prices of the loan note. The annual interest received on the face value of the units of the loan notes. Yes. Okay, then with reference to the Islamic finance, the term riba refers to interest. Yes, the form of equity where the partnership exists and the profits and losses are shared. No, this is musharika. The predetermined interest get collected by the lender, which the lender receives over and above the principal amount that it has sent out. Yes, this is interest. So this is riba. Form of the credit sale, form of the deeds, no. Clear? But is Islamic financial will be the part of our slavery? No, no numericals are included, uh, included only that discussion. Only those five portions, discussion on them. But usually, uh, when we look into the practical, there is no loss for the banks. Yes, yes that's, that's basically what they are doing. They are just telling us that we are based upon the Islamic financing, but they are actually not. But if we if we do see the Islamic financing as well, they are also, you know, particularly, they are also based upon the profit. If, if there is a loss, then loss is not going to be given. This, this is the basic of the uh, Islamic financing as well, or the Murabha as well. If there is a loss, then we are not going to give. I mean, uh, if there is a loss, the lender will not uh, lend, or uh, the investor will not invest in it. No, in the, in, not in the case of uh, Mudaraba and Musharika, in the case of the first fixed fixed ones. That Musharika and Mudaraba is the kind of the partnership. But in the case of Ijra, or in the case of Murabaha, uh, or if, in the case of the third one, if there is a loss, then it is not going to be. You really buy a car and the UAE is really used to call Murabaha. Yes, that, that is a great credit. Great credit means we buy one and then get Yes. Yes, the ordinary, you know, a form of leasing again. Again, a kind of leasing element is coming in that also. You know, the trade credit in the normal way the trade credit is working. So the same condition is going to be applied to them. Okay, if you want to take a break. You can, then we can start, or if you do not want to take a break, we can start the dividend policy. 15, 15 minutes, okay? okay. Yeah. <laughs> Angelica, are you there? Yes, miss, I'm here. Okay, okay we are going to resume the talk. Okay, now students, this is chapter number 15. Uh, again, this one, uh, this one is very small chapter. Again, few theory part is going to be discussed in this chapter. That is about dividend policy. Obviously, dividend is the return which is given to the equity shareholders and other taxable shareholders in order to attract them to invest in the company. 
which dividend policies can company adopt and which one would be more suitable for the companies to adopt. So in this chapter, we are going to discuss about irrelevance of the source of equity finance. We are going to discuss about the MNM Mordigliani uh, and Miller dividend policy, about real world issues. We are going to discuss about the alternatives to dividends. So all these are theoretical parts. Now students, the dividend decision. Whether the company has to give a dividend to its shareholders or not can be a question mark for the company's management at all the time. Because some of the persons who have invested in the company are of the mind that they think that dividend is irrelevant. Some of them might feel that dividend is relevant and dividend must be given. So which policy the company has to adopt may be a question mark for the company. So they say, we have already seen in the chapter on sources of finance that retained earnings are an important source of finance for both the long and short term purposes. But, but if the company is using retained earning in order to invest in its operations, then for giving it to the shareholders, the amount which they need to give to the shareholders as a dividend would be lesser. Whether the shareholders would be allowing it or not, this is a question mark. So they have no issue costs, they are flexible, they don't need to be applied for or repaid, and they don't result in the dilution of control. So there are so many advantages of using retained earnings in the operations, but still we need to see that whether shareholders would be interested in this or not. Because if the shareholders are not going to be interested, the share price of the company is going to be lesser, it is going to affect the company adversely. Then the key question is, if a company chooses to fund a new investment by a cut in the dividend, what will be the impact on the existing shareholders and the share price of the company? So obviously, if there are no particular problems, then every company would be wanting to finance the operations by using. But they need to consider the demands of the shareholders as well and the demands of the market in which the company is operating. So we can consider three types of dividend policies. These are dividend irrelevancy, residual theory, and dividend relevancy theory. The people, the shareholders who have invested in the company can any of the category to be falling in. The first category is dividend irrelevancy theory. The shareholders who are falling in this part do consider dividends as irrelevant. They find that even if the dividends are not going to be paid to them, it is not going to affect them badly. Because if the company is using retained earning in order to invest in different kinds of processes, then obviously the share price of the company is going to boost up. Instead of earning, making the earnings by getting the dividend, they can uh, you know, sell their shares in the market to get the capital gains. If the share price of the company is going to boost up, if the dividends are not being paid and the retained earnings are used in order to invest in so many projects and resultantly the share price increases, Obviously, even if the dividends are not paid, the, the shares can be sold outside to get capital gains. So the persons who are following dividend irrelevancy theory, they find that dividends are not relevant to their needs. Then the persons who are lying in the second category of the residual theory, they find that the dividends are important, but the amount which is going to be paid as the dividends is not important. If resultantly all the amounts which together will be given to them is the same. If say for example in one year even if the dividend is not being paid and in the another year double dividend is being paid to them then it is not going to make any difference for them. So the dividend is maybe not, uh, the dividend is important for them but the dividend stream is not important for the residual theory members. Then we do have dividend relevancy theory. The persons who are going to find uh, be in this theory matters, they find that dividends are relevant. The dividends must be given to them. If the dividends are not going to be paid, then the share price of the company is going to become low because in the market, the persons are having a stimulus that the dividend is not going to Companies having cash flow problems and it is going to be diluted, it is going to be liquidated in the future. So basically dividend relevancy persons, the persons who are falling in this category are of the mind that dividends are most to be paid. Now other practical constraints for the dividends are that there are some legal restrictions on the dividend payment sometimes. 
Sometimes the company has taken the loans and the person who are provided who are providing these loans to the company may not be allowing the company to give the dividends to the shareholders because if the retained earnings will be used in order to give the uh, amount dividend to the shareholders then obviously the company would not be having an amount to invest in the future prospects and the company would not be able to earn returns and if the company is not able to earn returns then there is a risk for the loan providers so the person who are having a lot of assets as a security from the company will not be allowing the company to give the dividends as a free cash flow to the shareholders. Then there can be liquidity problems as well. If the company is going to pay the dividends, then the liquidity of the company is going to be affected. So the company, instead of giving the cash dividends, can follow these three operational matters. They can do the share repurchase, what they can do instead of giving the dividend to the shareholders, the same amount of cash can be used to purchase, repurchase their shares. And when the shares are going to be repurchased, the control which has been diluted previously is going to be in the hands of the company once again. Instead of giving the dividends to the company, the company can adopt the policy of script dividends as well, in which instead of giving the cash dividends to the shareholders, the company to give them the capacity to purchase the shares of the company. So the offer is going to be made to them that do not get the cash dividend, but instead take the shares of the company. But again, the major flaw of the script dividend or the script uh, dividend policy is going to be that the dilution of control is going to be there. Hence, because uh, since new, new shares are going to be issued to the general public, to the existing shareholders, maybe that is why the company's control is going to be diluted. It is going to be out of the range of the company. Then we do have the last policy that is bonus issue. Bonus issue is again, you know, very much similar to the right issue in the case that the bonus issue is going to be made to the existing shareholders, not to the new shareholders. It will be issued as per the predetermined ratio in the proportion of the existing shareholders, this bonus issue is going to be made. But cash is not going to be taken as the capital. In case of having the bonus shares, the persons who are investing in the company will not be giving the cash. But the reserves of the company, retained earnings of the company will be converted to the share capital. So this is the, in the case of the bonus issue, again, the shares are going to be issued, but capital in the form of cash is not going to be taken. So existing shareholders, instead of getting the cash dividend, they will be getting the share capital of the company. So what is going to happen? The total shares of the company are going to increase. The share capital of the company is going to be divided into smaller denominations now. So this is bonus issue. So instead of giving cash dividends, the company can adopt the policy of share repurchase or they can issue the script dividends that in case of script dividends, instead of giving cash dividend, the shares are issued. And the bonus issue can also happen where the cash is not being taken for the investment. Instead, the retained earnings or the share premiums, the previous reserves of the company are going to be converted to the share. So this is all of the discussion in this chapter. We do not have anything else to be discussed. This is the smallest chapter of the book. So we do have some understanding students. Understanding number one, the dividends as residual view of dividend policy is best described as, what is the residual theory students? What is the residual theory? Is dividend important for the persons who are lying in residual theory? Are dividends important for them? No. Dividends are not important for them? They are considering that dividends are important, but they don't want to cash them. Like they do not want to get in cash? In cash. Okay, not, uh, the dividend streams are, uh, you know, not, not important. If, even if they are not getting in one year, in the next year, if they are getting, it's, yes. it's accurate for them. Okay. Then uh, what, what is the best description of this? Dividends are paid if the company generates profit greater than the previous year. No, this is not the condition. The profits made by the division of the companies particular in a particular country should be paid to the shareholders in the same nationality. Nothing. Dividend should amount to the entire annual profit less the amount paid in the manager incentive scheme. No. Dividend should only be paid out of the cash flow after the company has financed in all of its NPV projects. This is the residual theory. And in the case of residual theory, we also consider that the company instead of paying the dividend 
they will be investing in all the positive NPV projects and the company can later give the dividends and from the residual amount. So the first is first thing is that the company must be investing in all the residual, all the NPV, positive NPV projects. Then a script dividend. What is a script dividend? What is a script issue? Sorry? This one? Yeah. Script dividend? This bon uh, students don't be confused with script dividend and script issue. Bonus issue is also known as script issue. Okay. But in case of script dividend, instead of giving cash dividend, yes. shares are going to be offered. So script dividend is a dividend paid at a fixed percentage rate on the nominal value of the shares. No. A dividend paid at a fixed percentage rate on the market value of the shares on the date that the dividend is declared. No. A dividend payment that takes the form of the new shares instead of cash. Yes. yes. This is a script dividend. Instead of giving the cash dividend, the shares are offered. A cash dividend that is not fixed but is decided upon the directors and approved by the shareholders. No. Okay. Morty Giliani and Miller are due. Students, uh, Morty Giliani and Miller theory is dividend irrelevancy theory. Okay. So Morty Giliani and Miller argue that it is better to have a certainty of a non-dividend now than the uncertainty to have to wait. No. Consistency of a company's dividend stream is irrelevant as the means of affecting the shareholders wealth. Is this? This is residual theory. Consistency of the company's uh, dividend stream is irrelevant as means of affecting shareholders' wealth. Okay. Uh, a, a reduction in the dividend can convey bad news to the shareholders. Yeah. Is it? A reduction in dividend can convey bad news to the shareholders. Is this Morty Gilani and Miller theory? The, this, one, this one is dividend relevancy theory. If dividend is not going to be paid in the market, bad news is going to be present. It will create a stimulus that the company is not doing better and the share price of the company is going to come down. So this is the bad news, okay? Okay, then only when a company has invested in all positive projects should a dividend be paid if there are any ones remaining. Which one, which theory is this? Uh, yes, residual theory. Yeah. Okay, so which one is Morty Gilani and Miller argument? Which one? B. B. What do you say, Atif? The first one. Yes. Okay, for for the first case, what did you answer? No. This one, tell the dividends as the residual mean. D. D was the answer. This, that is the residual theory. So it means over there it was a residual theory, it's not MM. Okay. In this case, a script dividend. Uh, this one it was third one of new shares. A script, what is a script dividend, by the way? Paying back in shares. Yeah. Paying back in shares. Okay. Then for understanding number three, D is not the answer because that is residual theory. What about C, a reduction in dividend can convey bad news to the shareholders. This is relevancy. dividend relevancy. Okay, then B, consistency of the company's dividend stream is irrelevant as a means of affecting shareholders' wealth. This is the argument. Morty Gilani and Miller has provided us the dividend irrelevancy theory, but they have argued in the second residual theory. Okay, so this one consistency of the company's dividend stream is irrelevant as means of affecting shareholders' wealth. This is the argument given to us by MNM. Okay, so this is again the way of selecting the right answer. If all the others are not fitting, then the remaining one is the answer. Okay, now understanding number four MN proposition concerning dividend policy rests on the number of assumptions. My dear students, when MNM provided us the dividend irrelevancy theory, 
it is not going to be followed in every case that is for perfect market situations and what is a perfect market what is a perfect market there are perfect markets and imperfect markets yes what is an imperfect market monopoly duopoly oligopoly these are imperfect markets and in the perfect markets where there is a perfect competition we do feel that all the persons are risk averse no transaction costs are there no inflation is there so these are ideal situations in mmm theory the situation the assumptions which have been made are of the perfect market okay no transaction costs are going to be there only then the persons are going to be dividend irrelevant if they do not meet dividend in the case of inflation right now so with the conditions are going on everyone is dividend relevant okay so which assumptions are being followed these include no share issue cost yes no no admin costs are going to be there no bankruptcy cost yes no taxation no financial gearing no so option 1 and 2 are the assumptions 1 and 2 Okay, this one understanding number five. The traditional school of thought concerning dividend policy implies that managers should adopt as high a dividend policy as possible. Conventionally, this has been the thought. Then again, that those theories have been in place. Okay, so conventionally, we do see that the managers should adopt as high as dividend policy as possible. So this is true. Statement two. The MM school of thought uh, implies that managers should adopt as low a dividend policy as possible. Is it? Is this a stance taken by MM theory, dividend irrelevancy theory? They feel they feel they they have provided us a view that dividend is irrelevant. They do not say that we have to give as low dividend as possible. they say that dividend is irrelevant even if it is going to be paid or not it is irrelevant they do not tell us that as low dividend as it should be if it is going to be going on no so this was not the stance getting my yeah. I mean, what what did they tell what did mmm told us in dividend irrelevancy theory the dividend is irrelevant even if the cash dividend is not going to be paid it is not going to affect anyone but in the perfect market situation because if the persons do want a cash they will be uh, you know selling their shares in the market in the form of the capital gain they are going to get the amount they did not tell that as low as possible the dividend has to be paid okay this was not their stance so this is not being told that it it did not imply that the managers should adopt as low a dividend policy as possible so this is false first statement is true and the second one is false now students the real game is now going to be started that is cost of capital one question can be expected from this portion that is about weighted average cost of capital you must be it's most that you will be asked in the exam to calculate the weighted average cost of capital it will become a part of the third section now students whenever in the organization you are using the sources of finance you will not be using one source of finance you will be using debt financing you will be using equity financing in some cases you will be using right issue in some cases you will be using the bonus issue in some cases you will be using the new external share issue same is the case with the with the debt financing too you will be using loan notes you will be using hybrids you will be using convertibles etc each of the forces of finance will be bringing some cost to the company whatever capital is going to be raised by the company it will be having the cost for the company that cost which the company is bearing in order to raise the finance is known as cost of capital the average cost of capital for all the finances which the company is bearing is known as weighted average cost of capital how we are going to calculate the weighted average cost of capital in order to calculate weighted average cost of capital we need to learn to calculate the individual cost of each source of finance 
we should be learning that how can we calculate the cost of debt and cost of equity for the company but do they say we are going to identify the sources of financing which the company is using those sources of financing can be equity finance or they can be debt finance under debt financing we need to see that which form of the debt is being used for each type of the debt we are going to calculate the cost for each type of equity we are going to calculate the cost of equity we are going to merge them we are going to calculate weighted average cost of capital so companies are going to use different sources of finance and collectively they are going to give some cost for the company when collectively we are going to calculate the cost of cost if all the finances used by the company it is known as weighted average cost of capital now my dear students what is the overall approach to calculate the return being demanded we will assume that in the perfect market market value of the investment is equal to the present value of the expected future returns discounted at the investor's required return students what is the investor's required return we are going to discount it at the company's cost of capital investor's required return is the cost of capital for the company the re return which the investors do require will form the cost of capital for the company they are equal to each other in the case of equity financing in the case of equity financing i repeat the cost of capital is equal to the required rate of return but in the case of debt financing the cost of capital is not equal to the uh, required rate of return now they say if we do want to calculate the market value of the investment what is it the present value of the expected future returns discounted at the investors required return this is what we were doing for whole investment appraisal techniques we were discounting the future cash flows at the investors required rate of return that is cost of capital do you remember discount rate that is cost of capital because we want to calculate the market value of the investment in order to decide that which investment we need to take on this is the same as saying the investors required rate of return is the internal rate of return achieved by investing the current price and receiving the future expected returns this is the base premise that will be assumed for all the subsequent workings in the cost of capital calculation so they are telling you that investors required rate of return is equal to the cost of capital which is bearded by the company now estimating the cost of equity dividend valuation model this is the first model which is under consideration we are first going to learn to estimate the cost of equity for the company they say that if we want to calculate the cost of equity for the company one method which can be used in order to estimate is dividend valuation method why because cost of equity for the company is equal to the present value of all the dividends which are going to be paid in the future that is dividend valuation model they say the cost of equity finance to the company is the return the investors expect to achieve on their shares again they are telling us the same thing the cost of equity finance is equal to the return the investors are expecting what is the return which is expected by the investors that is dividend so we can say that cost of capital of equity for the company is equal to the present value of all the dividend future streams which are going to be paid by the company using our base premise outlined above we will be able to determine what return investors expect to receive by looking at how much they are prepared to pay for a share assumptions dvm states that future income stream is the dividend paid out by the company dividends will be paid in perpetuity dividends are never going to be stopped dividends will be constant or growing at a fixed rate so we are going to assume two things in dividend valuation model one thing is that dividends are constant the other thing is that even if they are growing they are going to grow at the constant rate so in exam situation also you will be required to calculate dividend without growth or dividend with constant growth share price what is going to be the share price dividend paid in perpetuity discounted at the shareholders rate of required rate of return 
Now students come to the formula. Dividend is human constant dividends without growth. So first situation is to apply the formula of dividend when there is no, uh, when there is uh, no growth and the dividends are going to remain constant. Dividends are going to be paid in perpetuity. They are going to be paid for indefinite time period and they are going to be constant without any growth. If this is the case, then price of the share is equal to the dividend divided by RE. RE is required rate of return students. In exam, if they are asking you the price of a share, then you are going to use this formula. If they are asking you to calculate required rate of return, then do rearrange this formula, it will become P over PO. In both the cases, they can ask you. So over here, PO stands for price of a share, that is market price of a share is equal to D for dividend divided by RE. RE is required rate of return. Now, my dear students, that is the case of the equity. In the case of equity, the cost of capital for the company is equal to the required rate of return. So whatever RE you are going to get, this will be equal to the cost of capital for the company. Are you understanding the point? Yes. Because this, are you understanding that? So in this case, you need to understand that cost which the company is going to bear will be equal to the required rate of return by the investors. So if there is a dividend valuation model with constant dividend, there is no growth in the dividend, then we are going to use this simple formula. So they say for listed companies, since the share price and dividend payment are known, the shareholders required rate of return can be found by rearranging this formula. So once you are going to rearrange the formula, that is going to become like this. Now understanding number one, calculate the cost of equity. Cost, look over here, now they are asking you to calculate cost of equity. They are not asking you to calculate required rate of return. You must know that cost of equity is RE, required rate of return, because in the case of equity, the required rate of return is equal to the cost of capital. A company has paid a dividend of 30 cents. Dividend is 30 cents. The company expects to continue paying dividends at this level in the future. So there is constant dividend. The company's current share price is $1.5. So $1.5 either can be converted into the cents or 30 cents can be converted into the dollar. So you can take it as 0 0.3 divided by 1.5. So this is going to be the required rate of return. That is the cost of equity. Got it? Sorry? So uh, sorry, this, this is 30 cents. So this is going to become 0 0.02. No ma'am, three. Sorry? Three. 30 cents. So oh sorry, yes, 33. Sorry. No, it's not about lunch actually. My green problem. I told you know, before. <laughs> so are you clear? This is how we are going to calculate. If we are asking us to calculate the share price, we can calculate it as well. Got it, Arthur? Okay, now students, DVM growth at a fixed rate. Now we are going to change the formula, formula slightly if there is a slight, if there is a constant rate of growth. Like always, what we are going to do, we are just going to add 1 plus G with our current dividends in order to add the growth factor. Other than that, our formula is going to remain the same. So it will become PO is equal to DO. DO is current dividend into 1 plus G divided by required rate of return minus G. Got it? And if you are required, if you are required to calculate required rate of return, then your formula is going to become like this. RE is equal to DO1 plus G divided by PO plus G. You can write both of these formulas. So they say, although in reality, a firm's dividend will vary year on year, a practical assumption is to assume a constant growth rate in perpetuity. So for you, because this is just a bookish knowledge, we are going to consider, we are going to assume that the growth rate is constant. In practical situations, it's not constant. It is going to change year on year. 
So what we are going to do in order to calculate the shear price, the formula is they going to be DO that is current dividend into one plus G divided by required rate of return minus G. If we are required to calculate required rate of return, the formula will be DO into one plus G divided by PO plus G. Where G is the constant rate of growth in dividends expressed as a decimal. D1 is the dividend to be received in one year. Students, when we are going to multiply 1 plus G with DO, it will become D1. DO 1 plus G is the dividend just paid, adjusted for one year's growth. Therefore, to find the cost of equity, the formula can be rearranged to this. R E is equal to DO into 1 plus G divided by PO plus G. Now, students understanding the yes, sure. No need to write this this one. Okay. Let's write the first portion. Okay. Now, students, test your understanding. Two P company has just paid a dividend of ten C. So this is the current dividend students, this is DO. Shareholders expect dividend to be grow, growing at 7% per annum. P company's current share price is 2.05. Calculate the cost of equity. What is the formula of cost of equity? Required rate of return students tell me. DO. Yes, formula. One plus G. One plus G divided by RE. RE. What is the formula for required rate of return, cost of equity? Cost of equity is the required rate of return. PO. PO. Hatta? Sure? Yeah. Where is plus G? Plus G. Yeah, plus G. Sorry, sorry. Hatta, are you getting clear? The formula which you are telling is for PO. In PO, we are going to take RE minus G as a denominator. Two formulas are there. Look. Look. Two formulas are there. For PO, that is shear price. And this one, required rate of return. Required rate of return is cost of capital or cost of equity. When you are doing PO, then the denominator is RE minus G. If you are calculating R in the denominator is PO, and in the end you are going to add G factor as well. Got it? So you are going to add G. So students, what is current dividend? It's 10 cents. One. One plus, sorry, yes, 0 0.1 or 10 cents you can take. Shareholders expect the dividends to be growth at 7%. 0 0.07 divided by PO, the current share price is 2.05. So in in uh, you know in in cents you can take it zero point two zero five and then plus g seven percent zero point zero seven. Point five nine. First, do this portion, Arthur, and then plus G. No. Uh, Hashir, can you help him, please? Yeah. Point one. Two. This one. Okay. Point to the 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 point
Do you want to two zero five or point two five? Point two three. In both, in you both. Ways, sorry. Corners. Oh, okay. See, if you do the sense, ten plus one two is a zero point. Is it? I don't sense it. Like all of it. Do it in this way. Okay. Okay. If it's not zero point one divided by two point zero five. If you are not getting it. Zero point one double two one nine. Yes. If you do not want to convert uh, dollars into cents, then convert cents into dollars. You were taking one as dollar, one as cents. That's all important to take it. Okay, now, if dividends are expected, the second, third question. If the dividends are expected to grow at an annual rate of 3%, calculate the cost of equity. Again, you are required to calculate RE. A company has recently paid a dividend of 0.23 per share. So the word is, uh, right now, the dividend is 0.23. The current share price is 3.45. And the annual growth rate is 3%. Divided by current share price is 3.45. And growth rate is 3%. So you will be calculating the Required rate of return. Students, these formulas will not be given to you in exam, so try to learn them. Sure, sure. 1.03 multiplied by 0.23. Now, six point eight nine. No. No, what? 9.86, yes. 10, yes. 0.96. Yes, uh, multiply the 100 in percentage you are going to get. 9.86 or 10 percent rounded. Ashar, it's only about the calculations to you. Got it. Got it? 10% now, 9.86. Angelica, did you get the same? Yes, Miss, 9.87. Yes, correct. Okay, now students, we are going to discuss about the concept of come dividend and ex dividend share price. As its name is suggesting, come dividend. Sure, is it a call? Yeah. Sh shall we carry on? Yeah, you can. Okay, now they are telling us the concept of come dividend and ex dividend share price. Come dividend is including the amount of dividend and ex dividend is excluding the amount of dividend. So what is going to be the ex dividend share price? Marshall, it's simple. Come dividend share price minus dividend amount or the dividend due amount is equal to ex dividend share price. So they say when, when we are being given the PO, PO is basically ex dividend share price. Okay. If they, in the exam, they are giving you the come dividend share price, then you have to convert it to the ex dividend share price in order to put it in the formula in the place of PO. So PO represents the ex dividend share price. A question may give you the come dividend share price by stating that the dividend is to be paid shortly. So come dividend share price minus dividend due is equal to ex dividend share price. The requirement of the question is to calculate the value of PO, the X dividend share price. What is the formula for PO? PO it is uh, there is is there any growth? No, no. The current share price is one forty cents. The dividend of AXC is due to be paid shortly. What is the formula? PO is equal to divided by PO divided by R E. Okay, now PO is uh, if you are required to calculate PO, the PO is the X dividend share price, is it? Yeah. So what is PO? Um, How are you going to calculate PO over here? Uh, the current share price is already given. The current share price is 140 cents and the dividend is AHC. Yeah. So students, this, this one is the, this one is the come dividend share price and dividend is AHC. So 140 divided by uh, 140 minus 8 will be the ex dividend share price that is PO. Got it? 
Uh, Atif, before you were out, we were discussing about that formula. Come dividend share price is the amount including dividend and X dividend share price is excluding dividend. In the exam, when PU is going to be given, this has to be assumed as the X dividend. Okay, so if they are giving you the come dividend share price, you first have to convert it into the X dividend in order to put that in the formula. Okay, so 140 minus 8 cents will be the uh, X dividend share price, simply. Okay, then understanding number five students, calculate the cost of equity for D company. Now you are required to calculate the cost of equity. What is the formula for cost of equity students with growth? What is the formula? DO? One plus G. One plus G divided by PO plus G. Okay, now D company is about to pay a dividend of 15 cents. This is a dividend which they are about to pay. Shareholders expect dividend to grow at 6% per annum. D company's current share price is $1.25. Calculate the cost of equity. Students, can you do this question? Yeah. Do it then. First, calculate the ex dividend share price. What is ex dividend share price, Arthur? 15 cents minus 6%. Oh, sorry. Uh, share price, share price, share price, share price. Yes, yes. 1.25 minus 15. Uh, not 15, 0.15, okay? In, in sense it is given. So X dividend share price will be 1.25 minus 0.15. It's 1.1. X dividend share price is 1.1. DO is, how much is DO students? It's 15 cents. 0 0.15. One plus growth is how much? 6%. 0.06 divided by PO, what did we find? 1.1. 1. 1.1 1. 1 PO we have found. And growth factor is 0 0.06. This will be the cost of equity that is required rate of return. 0. 20.45 into 1.06 divided by 1.1 plus 0. 0.06. Yes, 20.45. Yes, Arthur, did you get the same? Oh. So you need to consider that PO is the X dividend share price that is excluding the amount of dividend. Look, one by one, we are learning that. How are we going to calculate the cost of equity? So the first case is dividend valuation model. Now, sometimes in the exam, the growth rate will not be given to you. So growth rate can also be calculated by using this formula, which is in front of you. I suggest you to use this one, okay? Do not be into the case of using under it, okay? So the formula to calculate growth is DO, that is current dividend, divided by dividend n years ago. Dividend which is which was there some years ago uh, at the rate of one over uh, n minus one. This is the formula. Current dividend divided by dividend n years ago. You have to take the power one over n minus n. Okay. The requirement of the question is estimate the annual growth rate in dividends. A company currently pays a dividend of 32 cents. So the current dividend is how much? 32 cents. Divided by five years ago, the dividend was 20 cents. The dividend n years ago, n is how much? Five. Raised to the power one over five and minus one. Nine point eight percent. Nine point eight percent. did you get the same? No. In my calculator, the option to take the power is not there. Same answer.
Let me check from the book. Uh, Harshad, what is your answer? Yeah, nine point eight five. Yes, ten percent. They have rounded it. Nine point eight. Yes, you are going to round it. Growth. Okay, now again you are required to calculate the growth rate using past dividends. So, what is the formula? What is the formula, students? D O divided by divided by dividend n years ago raised to the power one over n minus one. Okay, use the same formula. Calculate the average annual historical growth rate. So, current dividend a company has paid the following dividends per share over the last five years. Now, for five years, the dividend has been given. The current dividend is fourteen point five. And dividend n years ago, dividend one, two, three, four, four years ago has been ten cents. Ten. And we are going to take the power of one over n. N is how much? Four. Is it one, two, three, four minus one? How much it is? Yes, the questions are usually easy, but in the exam, when so many things are coming in front of you, then you become confused. So the best way is to do the revision kit because in revision kit we are getting the elaborated questions. Yes, dear. Nine point seven. Nine point seven. Nine point six. How? Forty point four divided by which is 1.45, that you can see it. Yes, 9.7 is the right answer. Yes. Atif, now you got the same? Okay, now students, we can calculate the growth by using uh, Gordon's method as the Gordon's growth model. According to that, the growth is equal to the B into required rate of return, where B is the earning retention rate and R E is the accounting rate of return. What is an accounting rate of return? A R R. Return on investment. Return on investment. Yes. Return on capital employed. That is accounting rate of return. Okay, return on capital employed is accounting rate of return. So Gordon's growth model can also be used in order to calculate growth where formula will be G is equal to B into R E where B is the earnings retention rate. How many earnings are retained in the company are going to be the earning retention rate. Okay, the question is understanding number eight, the requirement of the question, if the company's return on equity and earning retention rate remain the same, you have to assume if the company's return on equity, return on equity is return on capital employed and earning retention rate, earning retention rate is B, remain the same. What will be the growth in dividends in the next year 2007? So we have been given the condition of 2005 and the condition of 2006 and they are asking the growth rate in the 2007. So my dear students, the formula, because we are in Gordon's growth model, what is the formula? Growth is equal to B into R, where B is the retention rate. They say, consider the following summarized financial statements for X, Y, Z. This is the position for 2005. They say profit after tax for the year ended 31st December 2006 at 20. Students, R, E is the accounting rate of return. That is return on capital employed. What is the formula for return on capital employed? Profit before interest on tax, which is also known as operating profit, capital divided employed. by capital employed. What are capital employed? Assets are capital employed or assets minus current liabilities are also capital employed or non-current liabilities plus equity are also known as capital employed. Yes. So by different formulas, you can calculate capital employed. Basically, this is an amount of capital which is employed in the company in order to generate economic resources. So students, with this, with the help of this formula, how can we calculate return on capital employed? Profit after tax, they have given that is 20. And capital employed, ordinary shares plus reserves you can take, that is 200. 
So divided by 200, this will be the capital employed. How much it is? 20 divided by 200? 0 0.1 or 10% is the return on capital employed. Now we have to see the retention rate, earning retention rate, that is B. They say dividend, a 40% payout is H. Students, if uh, dividend payout rate is 40%, retention rate is 60%. If dividends are being paid at 40%, it means that the company is retaining at 60%. So simple it is, G is equal to B is 60% and R e we have calculated as 10%. How much it is? This is going to be the growth rate in 2007. 600. 600? 60% into 10%. 60% yeah. into 10%. 60% into 10%. 0.6 into 0.1. 6%. Yes, 0 0.06, that is 6%. Growth rate is 6%. Clear? Now, in exam, they may not be telling you to apply the Gordon's growth model or uh, the simple, you know, the other DVM with growth. You have to select the method as per the data given to you. Now, my dear students, the assumptions which are being made by dividend valuation model, that is, the dividend is going to remain constant or it's going to grow with the constant rate may not be practicable. So these can be the weaknesses of DVM. They say the DVM has the sound basic premise. The weakness occurs because the input data used may be inaccurate. Current market price, future dividend present uh, patterns and the growth in earnings is ignored. So it is ignoring, clearly ignoring the growth in earnings. Now, my dear students, again, the next form of the equity is the preference shares. Preference shares are also our equity, and we should learn to estimate the cost of preference shares as well. Students, what are preference shares? These are the kind of the shares which are going to have the priority over to the ordinary share capital. Again, the cost of equity, even in the case of the preference shares, is going to have, is going to bring the equal required rate of return. So in the case of this equity also, RE is equal to the cost of equity. Students, why I am repeating this point again and again, and I feel that you people are not, might be focusing on this point. It's very important that in the case of equity, required rate of return is equal to the cost of equity for the company. This point is very important. The return which the investors are requiring is equal to these directly equal to the cost of capital which it is bringing to the company. In exam, they can ask you with both the names. They can ask you to calculate the cost of equity, cost of capital, or to calculate required rate of return. But when they are going to ask in the case of the debt, then required rate of return will be meaning something different, and cost of equity, cost of debt will be meaning something different. So try to focus on this point that in case of equity, RP is equal to the cost of equity. So we are on the cost of preference shares in order to calculate cost of preference shares again, the same formula is going to be used that we have used in the case of dividend valuation model. What is that? PO is equal to D over RE. Over here, RE is replaced by KP. KP is the cost of preference shares, okay? K here they are taking as cost. So cost of preference shares is equal to D over PO or PO is equal to D over KP. So the same formula is going to be used. Here also PO is the X dividend market price of the shares. Dividend D is equal to the constant and preference here, uh, dividend and KP is equal to cost of the preference shares. They say the fixed dividend is based on the nominal value of the preference shares. I may told you in the start, if you remember that in the case of the preference shares, the constant amount of the dividend is going to be paid. Do you remember? In the, in the case of cumulative and non-cumulative preference shares, I told you that same amount of dividend is going to be paid every year. So no growth is going to be there. So this they are telling the fixed dividend is based on the nominal value of the preference shares, which may well do not assume the nominal value is always $1. So no growth you are going to assume in the case of the preference shares. The formula is going to be the same as dividend without growth model. Now here is it, understanding number 10 students. What is the cost of the preference shares? What is the cost of the preference shares? What is the formula student? KP is equal to 
P over P O. Very good. Where P O is the ex dividend market price. The company has 50,008% preference shares in issue. Student overview B would be how much? 8%? Is it? 8% on uh, 100 nominal value. Nominal value is always 100. So it will be how much? 8% of 100? 8. Divided by nominal value is one dollar over here they have given us the nominal value of 100 the current x dividend market value is 1.2 dollars per share so this will be the cost of the preference shares 8 divided by 1.2 sorry 6.67 percent is the cost of preference shares got it very simple it is now, my dear students, estimating the cost of debt. The debt can be irredeemable, the debt can be redeemable, or the debt can be convertible. Or on the other hand, the debt can be simple in the form of bank loans. What is an irredeemable debt? The debt which is never going to be redeemed. The principal amount is never going to be returned, but the interests are going to be paid in perpetuity. Redeemable debt, the amount of the principal is going to be paid at the end of the specified time interval. The convertible debts, they may not be redeemed or they may be redeemed with the option of getting converted into the another form of security, specifically the shares and the bank loans. Terminology, the term loan notes, bonds, loan stock and marketable debt are used interchangeably. Gifts are debts issued by government. Students, zero rate bonds or the gifts are known as government securities. They are also known as risk free securities. Irredeemable debt, no payment of principal, interest is in perpetuity. Redeemable debt, interest paid until redemption of principal. Convertible debt may be later converted to equity. Key points to note debt is always quoted in $100 nominal value blocks. Interest paid on debt is stated as the percentage of the nominal value called the coupon rate. The term X interest and come interest are used in much the same way as X dividend and come dividend was uh, for the cost of equity calculations. What is the example of irredeemable uh, debt? They can be simple loan stocks. Simple loan stocks with, with the conditions of redemption and irredemption. What is the benefit for the investor to lend money or which one? What is it in the If the interest will be in perpetuity, the interest is never going to be stopped. In the case of redeemable debts, the amount of interest is going to be stopped once the debt is going to be redeemed. Got it? Look, for example, we have seen, told with irredeemable debt, no repayment of principal, but interest is in perpetuity. It is never going to be stopped. Okay, but in practical situation, it has to be stopped at some time, time limit. But it will be more than the redeemable debt. Okay, longer time interval for redeemable debt. Interest is paid until redemption date only. Okay, got it now, Atif. Okay, now, now here because we are going to estimate the cost of debt now. Now you must consider that required rate of return is not equal to the cost of capital for the company. Why? Students, the required rate of return is not equal to the cost of capital because the whenever the debts are going to be there, they, is, they will be tax deductible. The tax relief is going to be brought by the debts. So that is why the required rate of return is higher than the cost of capital for the company. The cost of capital, which is going to be bearded by the company, is lesser than the required rate of return because company will be having tax relief on this. So cost of debt is tax deductible, one minus T on this. Okay. So this is also known as today's cost of capital is also known as post tax cost of equity, a uh, cost of capital or post-tax discount rate. And required of return is known as pre-tax. 
and all the names, with all the names it can come in the exam. The required rate of return is not equal to the cost of capital. It is always higher than the cost which the company is bearing because the cost which the company is bearing is tax deductive. The company is going to have the tax release. The higher the interest payments are going to be there, they will be deducted from the profit of the company and the company's tax is going to be lesser. This does not happen in the case of dividends. That is why for dividends, R is equal to the cost of capital, but in the case of debt, it is not the same. So in the exam, when they are going to ask you for the required rate of return, they can ask you for the free tax rate as well. If they are asking about the cost of capital, they can ask you for the post-tax cost of capital. So they say the cost of debt and the impact of tax relief. A distinction must be made the, between the required return of the debt holders, lenders, and the company's cost of debt. Although in the context of equity, the company's cost is equal to the investor's required return, the same is not true of debt. Okay, so they are writing it also. This is because of the impact of tax relief. Consequently, we will use separate terms to distinguish the two figures. KD, the required return of the debt holders that is pre tax. KD, one minus C, the cost of debt to the company that is post tax. Care must be taken since it is not always possible to simply calculate KD, 1 minus C by taking KD and multiplying by 1 minus C. You should therefore regard KD, 1 minus C as a label for the post tax cost of debt rather than the mathematical formula. Students, when you are going to calculate the cost of debt, every time you are going to write 1 minus C with it. This is not the part of the formula. This is just the label in order to differentiate. KD 1 minus T means cost of debt for the company. That is what they are trying to explain over here. Okay. Note also that KD, the required rate of the debt holder, can also be referred to as the yield, the return on debt, or as the pre tax cost of the debt. Clear? Now, students. Because we have cleared about this discussion, now we are going to learn how can we calculate the cost of the different kinds of the debt, redeemable debt, irredeemable debt, convertible debt, and bank loan. Now, estimating the cost of the debt, the first one under discussion is irredeemable debt. Students, irredeemable debt is the one which is never going to be redeemed. In practical situations, there might be some time period in which the debt is going to be redeemed, but in theoretical, in theory portion, we are going to resume that irredeemable debt is never going to be paid. So students, what is the required rate of return for this? When the debt is never going to be repaid, this is the present value of the interest payments in the future. So the company does not intend to repay the principal, but to pay interest forever. So that is why the market value is equal to the future expected income stream from the debt, discontinued at, uh, uh, discounted at the investor's required rate of return. So what is the market value? Future expected income stream. What is future expected income stream? Interest amounts, which are discounted at the investor's required rate of return. Expected interest in income stream will be the interest paid in perpetuity. So in order to calculate the market value of students, the formula is equal to I over KD. I is the interest divided by KD. Got it? Okay, we are. So this is this one is market value. This one is what? Which one? Market value is equal to I over KD. This is pre tax or post tax? Pre tax. Pre tax. And this one is required rate of return. This one is required rate of return, students. Got it? This one is required rate of return, not the cost of debt. Where I is equal to annual interest starting in one year's time, MV is equal to market price of the loan note, KD is equal to debt holders required return, pre tax cost of debt, expressed as a decimal. The required return pre tax cost of debt can be found by rearranging the formula. Now, students, if we want to calculate the required return that is pre tax cost of the debt, we are going to rearrange the formula that is I over MV. 
But students, in this I, now we have to add 1 minus T. Because cost of debt for the company is not equal to the required rate of return. Got it? So over here, when we are required, we are going to change the formula also. When we are required to calculate the cost of debt for the company, then it will become I into 1 minus T divided by M. Now over here, we have rearranged the formula in return. My dear students, when you are going to use this formula, please focus that on the left of the question, this one is used as a label. Over here, you are not going to do the calculation as well. 1 minus T over is it's not going to be done here. Okay? But on the right side, the calculation is going to be done. The formula is I 1 minus T divided by M. Okay, now understanding number 11 students, what is the return required by the debt providers, the pre tax cost of debt, and what is the post tax cost of debt to the company? What will be the formula for the first case? What is the return required by debt providers? What is that? Not, not one. That is I. MP is equal to. I over I over KD. KD. And the second one, post tax cost of debt, that is KD. One, one minus T, which is just a label. And then I, I one, minus T one. Students, this is one, okay? One minus T one. divided by M divided by M P. Okay, company has an issue 10% redeemable. So the first one we can do first. A company has, a, has an issue 10% irredeemable debt. I is how much? I is 10%. 10%. 10%. Then you can take simply irredeemable debt quoted at 80x interest. The corporation tax rate is 30%. Calculate it. What is the required return? Simple. These are calculate and tell me. So let's do both the questions. <clears throat> Do both of the questions. Then you not compare. You can just compare your answers. Done. Done? Yeah. Other did you do in the same way? Yeah. But the thing is that uh, uh, in, in case of I will say annual interest or annual interest rate, it is rate or interest. No, no, no. Interest rate. Yeah. Basically, look, basically it's on uh, the nominal value is hundred. Yes. So that is why the interest is going to remain the same. Because of always on the nominal value, it's an assumption that we are going to calculate only on 100, okay? So that's why. Okay, then in the second case. There's coupon rate. Again, the pre-tax, yes, coupon. Again, that is coupon rate is interest rate. There's no change or change. No change. Only the difference is the amount. Yes, only the difference is the amount. Why? Homework. Okay, students, can we have a class on Saturday? Can we have a class on Saturday? Because you told that Saturday is most, uh, you know, it's easy for you people to attend. Uh, uh, because he's working. So yeah, we need to fine. give a respect to him, no? Yes. Okay, so. Okay, on Saturday. Actually, we do have a time because none, none of you is attempting the paper in this December. Okay. Uh, even then, I do want to finish the syllabus in time so that, uh, Harshal, you can get the time to focus on your other papers, F5 and F7. And Atif, you can, you can also start revising the concepts. Okay. So I feel that it will be beneficial. Otherwise, 
Otherwise, our syllabus would be completed towards the end of this month. Okay, so maybe for Hashir, it will be difficult to attend you know, the towards the last. But last class will be on 24th, I feel. It will be lost for him, so, Yes, better to finish. Yeah. We are going to finish because as soon as we are going to finish, you will be getting more time to revision for it. Okay, so now we can end the class and we are going to learn the remaining concepts in our Saturday class. Okay, uh, is it fine for you to have the class on Saturday? Yeah, miss, as long as it's morning, it's fine. Yes, in morning, in morning. So which time? 10, 10 o'clock again? 10 o'clock. So we are going to see that whether we are going to finish the portion in two hours or three hours, whatever the case is, we are going to finish accordingly, okay? Okay, then take care of yourself. If there is anything, any question you can ask me. No questions or so many questions? No questions. No, 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 no. <laughs> and you, you people have the test as well. Don't think that I forgot the test. Actually, I will be sending you the test document and you have to do it from your homework. And after you have not submitted your previous test as well. I submitted. I was supposed to do, but some things came to I Actually, I, I can understand that you are mature and you have so many things to do. But still try to revise the things, okay? It is too much. And did you prepare for the test? What did the Hashir? Hashir, I don't I don't know because you are focusing on the I didn't prepare. Working capital and investment appraisal. But I know. Adil, did you get the time to prepare? Investment appraisal and working capital? Did you do? Slightly so you did? Okay, that even then it's fine. Have you opened revision kit? Have you started doing it? Uh MC. MC, that's great. Even then it's fine. Okay. So we are going to finish the remaining portion on Saturday, okay? So next week we are going to finish our classes. Uh, next, then next week, no, next to next week we are going to finish. If we are going to have this class, then two more classes we will be requiring. So that's what next uh, Thursday and Saturday again. Plus, that one. Thursday and Saturday again? Again Saturday? Okay. Saturday is my holiday, by the way. Okay, fine. No, let's have a long class and this weekend, Saturday. And, uh, no, no, not not for the Saturday, Tony. 